Transmissions, transmissions, transmissions. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. It's Transmission Day at Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, here along with Matt Allen, and we are your KTAR Car Guys. Heard every Saturday at 11 or noon right here on News 92.3 KTAR. At Bumper to Bumper Radio, we are helping you, the motoring public, have a better overall car experience. If you've got car questions, we've got answers, so we encourage you to give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Road Map, a little bit of transmission fact or fiction, open phones as always, and the block box of transmissions. <laughs> you like that reverb, Dave? You don't have your uh, uh, your yeah. little control panel out here today to, to put in the sound effects. But that's right. We're having a, a special bumper-to-bumper -bumper event today at Tri-City Transmission, which is just on the south side of the Tempe Marketplace, right by the Wise Guys. Or is that Danny's Family, Danny's car, family wash car Wash? Danny's Family Car Wash. Over there. And uh, it's a special event, open house. You know, if you've got a car, you own a transmission, too. So, uh, <laughs> you know, come on out, see the shop. We're serving up lunch. I see a nice uh, group of gathering over there at the grilled cheese truck. And uh, we've got uh, all the Tri-City Transmission staff here. But sitting with us is Keith Clark and Ken Magrum. And, of course, with Dave, that's 60 years of combined experience. And, and that's just the... Uh, the, the tip of the iceberg, and uh, all the staff is here, like I said, open house, cars up on the racks, giving tours, you can come in and see what's going on, what a real transmission shop looks like. Well, let's and, start out uh, with a little bit of fact or fiction. My dad said there was no such thing as a free lunch, fact or fiction. Uh, today I'm going to go with uh, fact, Dave, because <laughs> <laughs> like I said, we, we would throw it up a little, or not throw it up, I don't want to throw, mix it up a little Please. bit, uh, usually fact or fiction's later, but there is a free lunch today, that's right. So again, if you want to come out, and there's a lot of the bumper to bumper radio shops out here. And, uh, of course, Dave and I are here. You come in and, and meet us, meet the guys, meet the guys in your shop. And uh, Well, I'm blessed to have a couple of wonderful technicians. We've got Keith and Ken sitting here, and they're quiet, guys. Say hello. hello. Let everyone know you're here. Hello. hello. <laughs> Nothing like a little bit of pressure, huh? Right. I'm sweating more than usual, Dave. I don't know if it's because it's warm or because it's a little we different. A, we have an audience. We haven't done this before, <laughs> or it's been a while since we've done this. So, you know, uh, you know how I got in the transmission business is kind of ironic. When I was 16 years old, my first car was a 1984 Jeep CJ7. And I got it for $4,000, and I had been driving it a week. And after about a week, it started grinding in every gear. I put it in first gear, grind, put it in second gear, grind. Are you sure that's not because you didn't know how to drive? <laughs> no, I was pretty good at driving. <laughs> I was familiar, you know, I was always working on dirt bikes and go-karts and that type of thing when I was a kid. But this thing ground in every gear. So on the way to school, you know, I could kind of get in a gear. I pulled off at a transmission shop, and I told the guy what was going on, and he said, oh, yeah, let me go for a quick drive with you. So the guy jumped in the car. He ground every gear for me, not that I couldn't do it myself. I guess eventually it goes in easier, you know, once you chip the teeth off, you know. Wear it out a bit. <laughs> going easier next time. And I said, well, what do you think? And he goes, oh, you know, uh, synchros and bearings, you know. And I kinda, he kind of had his hands in his pants like Al Bundy, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, I just didn't feel real good about it. He said $600. I was like, well, I don't have six hundred dollars. I I had to beg, steal, and borrow to get the money to buy this thing. So I left there. I ground my gears all the way home, and I went and I got a manual for my car. And uh, the first thing it said, grinding in every gear, uh, check clutch release. So, you know, I adjusted the clutch linkage, and sure enough, it fixed it. So at that point, you know, I think I was kind of in the transmission business at that point. It wasn't it wasn't a big deal. So you you solved it yourself by so that's all twenty dollar Haynes manual at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, cars have changed a little bit since then, but well, and that that's uh, you know that's a, a manual transmission, maybe a little bit less complicated than the automatic. I don't I don't think anybody today is going to be opening up an automatic transmission. I, I remember in the '70s, the old Ford station wagon. What is that, uh, Keith? A C3 or something like? Probably the C4. '70s C4. C4. <laughs> you know, I remember my dad, and my uncle pulling that thing out on the ground and rebuilding it. But in today's transmissions. That's not happening. Mm. It's a, yeah, and, it's a thing of the past. And, and I think one of the, one of the things that that you say a lot, and, it, and we know is true, is oftentimes it's not the transmission that is the problem. That transmission has to do what it's told to do. It's just and, there, and, yeah, just there to do it. And and so, th 
it's usually not the transmission that needs the fix. It's, it's the guy or the computer or the module or the wiring or something that's telling it to do something wrong. So oftentimes people end up with a transmission maybe they didn't need. You know, it's get that fix and go back. It's doing the same thing, and then it's just a quick adjustment. All <laughs> well, my, all yeah, my maybe. point to all this, though, is the diagnostic of the transmission. So this was a simple explanation in a, in a manual transmission. And, uh, you know, the funny thing about manual transmissions is we hardly see them. There are maybe... One or two percent of what's on the road, it seems like, anymore. So we hardly see them. So the guys that can still diagnose a manual transmission are few and far between. Uh, but also the diagnostics and the automatic transmission. See, transmissions, they, qua they cost two or three times more than what you might remember because the average person buys a transmission every seven and a half years. It's not something you buy every day. The price of them is increased, which is, which is not a good thing, but at the same time, they last twice as long as they used to. So Keith and Ken here are very good at finding out what's wrong as opposed to just having to just go buy a whole other one and stick it in. Some thoughts on that, Ken? No, that's why we're here. I mean, our job is to, my job is to do what I can to keep the customer from spending money he doesn't have to, and it's also to keep so that the guys in the shop know exactly what they're going to repair. They don't want to have to go through it and do what Matt's talking about. You've done the repair, you get done with it, and whoops, it's the same problem all over again. We haven't really fixed anything. So, you know, my job is to find the fix, find the repair. Find out what's wrong. Right. Well, yeah, be and, and, I mean, you, the, the diagnosis is not the simple pulling the code. Oh, the transmission, there's a torque converter code. It needs a, trans or it needs a torque converter or it needs a whatever. Th that is where the diagnosis, you really need to get in and find out. And I think one of the nice things is Ken is the gateway to just about every car that comes through here. It goes through Ken for, for diagnosis and then goes out through the repair process. And if it needs a rebuild or needs open up, then it comes across. I won't call it a desk. Key. Well, you've got a desk back there, but, <laughs> boy, that build room, you know, I don't think there's a transmission guy in town that wouldn't uh, – Maybe give up his living room for that <laughs> for that room to have a place to uh, to uh, to build and work and, and, and so that's really I guess you guys work together too because not only do you have to know have a proper diagnosis but the builder needs to know what was happening and all those symptoms so it's not just like going through a, you know get one out of a box it's better to have yours built yeah it definitely ends up being a, a team effort between uh, Ken and I we uh, we definitely are the gateway and we. We really take, you know, our time to really do root cause analysis to make sure that we are getting to the cause, not just the, the symptoms that the customer is complaining about. Because we want to do it once, we want to do it right. That's all there is to it. Well, I saw walking around the guys, uh, owners of Larry Harker's Automotive, and, and they've been on the show before and talking to them. And and it's true. they we, we know it and we think about it, but he said it to us during the show. Is there's the problem. And then there's what caused the problem. Yeah. So you can fix the problem, but if you didn't fix the cause of that problem, you're going to be back. And I don't care if it's a transmission, uh, you know, a running problem, a bearing failure, uh, well, here's the deal. Whatever. There's this, there's this uh, belief in our business that transmissions only last 100,000 miles. And some of them do fail at 100,000 miles. Some fail at 80,000. Some at 60,000 miles. But on average, the life of these things is going way up. And what happens is that our business has been so quick to replace a transmission, uh, not our business, not Tri-City Transmission, but the industry. the industry has been so quick to replace a transmission that wasn't bad. You know, it could have a bad speed sensor, it could have a bad solenoid, it could have a bad throttle position sensor. You really don't want a shortcut, and we get phone calls every day, Dave, how much for a transmission? I don't know, what's wrong with it? You know, they say, just give me the worst case. Well, the worst case is you buy a transmission and you didn't need a transmission. That, to me, is awful. That's the worst case, and we don't want <laughs> to think about that. But people are so quick because as soon as they can feel out just what they're in, in for, I think it, they think it's going to lower their anxiety. But they become their own worst enemy. You've got to find out what's wrong with it and then spend money wisely as opposed to just pitching a transmission at it. Well, I th the, the best thing to do if you think you're having a transmission problem or any other problem for that matter, don't come in and tell us what to fix mm. or... or or get on, I guess it's okay, get on the internet, do a little bit of research. Maybe if you don't know anything, you want to just be familiar. But don't guide the repair. Take good notes. Does it do it when it's cold? Does it do it when it's warm? Does it do it when it's cold but then go away when it's warm? Does it do it just coming off the freeway? There's all those different scenarios. And if you can have a nice little list to bring to the advisor, 
And people get helps. frustrated at all the questions we ask them, but we're doing it for a reason. We want to know what's going on wrong. So even we're out, out here on remote and we're serving up lunch, but don't be afraid to give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. And I think we got the texting up, so you can also shoot us text at 411-923. Again, that's 411-923. Give us a call. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are out on location at Tri-City Transmission in Tempe across from the Tempe Marketplace. We've got a couple of my finest technicians in. We've got Keith Clark and Ken Magrum, and if you guys have got transmission questions, we've got 60 years of experience sitting here. If you want to come come on down to the shop, we're giving tours, and I've got the rest of the staff here. The 60 years of experience is just right here in this little this little booth. So uh, anything you want to talk about. But, Dave, don't forget about the most important thing is we got grilled cheese sandwiches for, oh, lunch. Yeah. <laughs> for lunch. Have you seen those tater tots rolling off that truck? Those look fantastic. I think they're low cholesterol, low fat, they're low salt, Any, anything you want. They taste really good. Yeah, so. keep, keep telling yourself that, right? <laughs> you know, I'm looking at the menu over there. Tater tots, and I'm thinking grilled cheese. What are they going to have? But they got the buffalo. Uh, so it's got what chicken, you know, buffalo spicy chicken wing, grilled cheese sandwich, ma- cheesy mac and rib ribs on the cheese. Really good. Mm-hmm. Well, let's go up first. This segment with Andrew. Go ahead, Andrew. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yes, um, I have a '97 Pontiac Grand Prix. Uh, I changed the pan gasket about ten months ago. And I got a, right after I did that, I started getting um, an engine check engine code and diagnostic for it was a TCC solenoid. And there was really no shifting problem, but now I noticed that when I'm getting on the freeway, 10 miles down the road on the freeway, I get the engine light going off. And I mean, really no shifting problems, but the, the same diagnostic code for that solenoid. And I'm just curious on what you guys might think it might be. Right, and I'm not I'm not sure that it's related to you changing the fluid out uh, necessarily, but a, a torque converter solenoid, a lot of transmissions, uh, their failure starts in the torque converter, and if you catch them soon enough, you can head that off so you don't have a transmission failure. But generally, a, a TCC code is going to be like a P0740, 740, 741, 742, somewhere in there, and it's just saying that we have a we have a torque converter clutch that's either the solenoid's not working, a uh, problem in the computer or in the wiring, or the clutch itself is not working. So the computer is recognizing that. You're not going to feel driving the car. You're not going to feel that torque converter clutch not locking up. As cars get older and newer, we're having a hard time sensing them when we feel them. We actually a lot of times have to look at a scanner to see the actual RPM change because it's about a 100 RPM change, maybe a 200 RPM change. It's almost imperceptive to most people driving the car. So it's not something you're going to feel. So, Ken, you got any thoughts on that? Uh, well, it, it is something that we see often on the Chevrolets on their General Motor products. Uh, like Dave said, it, it could be any of those above, and that's the reason we like to see the cars and go through the whole diagnostic process. Is we we try to eliminate what it could not be or would not be, and uh, it's really something we need to see, unfortunately, because that's just the nature of the way this transmission works. And like you said, you don't feel it, but it's happening, and it's lo- you're losing gas mileage because of it. Uh, the lockup clutch comes on when you're on the freeway, and it pretty much locks the engine to the tranny like an old standard transmission would, so you're one-to-one. So it's there for saving gas, it's there for emissions, and it's really something that needs to be checked out. So the best thing would be is bring it in so we can take a look at it, and I could take a look at it and see what's going on with it. And we can figure out it could just be an electrical issue, but until I look at it, we have no idea. Now, Dave, you said you, you can't really feel that. But I bet your guys' butts are tuned in and more sensitive <laughs> driving down the road in any car. I've been on test drives with Dave, and, and you go, did you feel that? No. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty good about getting in a car, you know, getting in a customer's car and go, oh, my God, those motor mounts are trashed. Right. What are you talking about? I drive car 30 ain't. cars a week, yeah. 30 cars a week, week, and that's the first thing I'm feeling for is that torque converter lockup. And so it's super perceptive. It's a little easier when there's a tachometer because you can see a little blip on the tack. But otherwise, you're not going to be seeing it. So they're hypersensitive. So, All right. What do you think? We'll take a call from Ron. Ron, what can we help you with today? Yeah, hi. Uh, I got a 2002 uh, Buick Rendezvous uh, uh, 
XL or XCL. Anyway, it's all wheel drive. Are you okay. Right? Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, what I got, and it's been a little while, and I got an AWD, an operative uh, light on my dash. And I thought, well, what the heck is going on? So I took it into the dealer. He's telling me like about $600 uh, to have it fixed because he says, well, you got a, a check valve in the rear end that's not performing properly. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Hmm. <laughs> Keith? <laughs> well, that's one that we would definitely have to look at personally to actually diagnose exactly what's going on with that system. Uh, all-wheel drive uh, systems now vary so much, very widely, and we that's something that we do specialize in as far as, you know, getting, t- getting down to the root cause of what's going on with your particular vehicle. So we'd have to do some homework on that. Between Ken and I, we would definitely uh, uh, figure out uh, what, what route, what direction we need to these, go. These, these all-wheel drive systems are becoming such a deal because they're putting them on everything. My Honda Element is all-wheel drive. Buick Rendezvous is typically a front-wheel drive car, and they shoot a drive shaft to the back. And maybe what that guy's referring to is a computer is watching the speed of all four wheels as well as watching the speed of the transmission, what's going on in that little transfer box, or they call it an angle <laughs> gear, and it's seeing a difference that it doesn't like. So it's probably saying that the rear differential is not engaging like it should or some problem like that. Some of this is a little bit of speculation just on, on some concept and theory, but it's seeing, it's seeing a problem there. One question I do have, um, did you have any tire service done? Well, or yeah, that, that's a common thing on the all-wheel drive cars. People don't, don't realize it is in a lot of cases, if you've got to buy four tires at a time, the rolling diameter, rolling radius of those tires is expensive. And I wrote a blog several months ago on the KTAR. If One you tire, to, two tire, yeah, four K- tire. Yeah, KTR.com. You go to bumper to bumper radio tab and there's a blog. You have to scroll back a little bit. But, you know, you've got uh, three worn down tires. And you, maybe you get a piece of debris or something. You're not quite ready for those. And you go put one new one on the front or one new one on the rear. That can cause some serious damage to the car. Or maybe you get lucky, like I think Keith was going to go, and it's going to turn on, a, turn on a check engine light or a traction control light maybe or ABS. And uh, be, and you can catch it before you really cause some cause some damage. And that's really the first thing. If you have an all-wheel drive car, you don't you don't buy tires one at a time or a lot of times two at a time. No. All four tires need to be purchased at a time. Times have changed. We can't do that anymore. And and that's an excellent point, Keith. And the first thing that we do when we have an all-wheel drive vehicle and an all-wheel drive problem is we have a, a tool called a stagger gauge, and we measure the diameter of the tire. I'm sorry, the circumference of the tire so that we can see, and, and anything more than a quarter to a half an inch. Oh, a half inch is, is big time. Big time. And there's a bulletin on Ford on these Ford Explorers, half an inch will ruin the transfer case. Uh, you know, it's the circumference. So if you look at a tire, you say, well, it's only 31 inches across. That's diameter. But if you look at the length of the thing all the way around, you ran a string all the way around the tire, you know, d- different story. Well, yeah, and, and it doesn't, it's not always necessary when you bought a new tire because I've seen four brand new tires on the car. They're like shoes. They run big, run small. Yeah, and and, and so it it definitely does make a difference. It's the weirdest things that will that can that can trip you up. And I know we can talk about a weird problem on a Volkswagen that you had uh, recent, recently, Dave. So again, we're at Tri City Transmission with a remote broadcast special bumper to bumper radio event today. And Tri City Transmission is just on the south side of Tempe Marketplace across from the car wash. We're feeding you grilled cheese sandwiches and, and uh, open house, and we're doing tours, and all the guys are here. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. I am sitting here with Matt Allen, and we've got a couple guys here from the shop on air with us. We've got Keith Clark, and we've got Ken Magram. I call them they're, they're the brothers from different mothers. Uh, the two of the main guys here at Tri-City Transmission. So today we're talking about transmissions. If you've got a transmission call, we've got 60 years of transmission experience right here to talk about it. If you've got another question about your car, don't hesitate. Give us a call, 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. And if you're anywhere in the neighborhood, basically our cross streets are Rio Salado and McClintock, right across from Danny's Family Car Wash at Tempe Marketplace. And we are buying lunch, so we've got the grilled cheese food truck out. 
for well, lunch? Not only lunch, Dave, but an open house. You've got a beautiful facility here. Uh, Mike and Leon are here. So a lot of people probably know Mike and Leon from back in the day with Tri-City Transmission. We started this place 42 years ago. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's a, it's a it's a staple in the the Tempe or the Tri City area, right? Hence the name. <laughs> well, one of the things that we do at Tri Cities we're super open door transmission shops. Kind of traditionally, no one likes to go to them. It's the last place you want to go. Uh, we, we're open door as far as transmissions are spread out. If you want to come down, see what a transmission looks like on the inside. It may not mean something to you, but we can explain it to you. We're giving tours here today, uh, just after the show. Come see what it looks like. And one of the things we got going in the back shop is we've got a brand name national remanufactured transmission that we bought tri-city bought we totally took it apart and then we've got a tri-city transmission that we totally took apart and we just so like wait a minute you're telling me you actually put it together and took it apart again uh-huh okay yours yes well, our transmission okay. <laughs> so but we like people to know because there's terms out there there's remanufactured transmissions there's rebuilt transmissions there's reconditioned transmissions there's recycled transmissions there's used transmissions there's all these different names for transmissions there's new transmissions new. I, have you ever bought a new transmission you well, maybe know, when you bought your new car they're about three times the prices <laughs> yeah well, a new transmission has a new car wrapped around it but i know i hear it at my shop once in a while and i'm sure you hear it here they say well i can buy a brand new one at you know the deal or from ford no you can't no, no, you get, a, you get a new one with a new car wrapped around it. On occasion, there's some new ones out there, but it's, it's not very often that it happens, and if there is, they're generally twice or three times the price that you're looking at. So they may be new to the vehicle. You know, it shows up in a box. But the reason we did this disassembly of these two transmissions is that, you know, one was a big brand name national thing, and, you know, we took it apart and looked at it, and, and the term remanufactured is not a term set up by the Federal Trade Commission or by the state of Arizona or by anybody the person you buy the transmission from, that's the guy that makes up what you're buying. You it's very subjective. It can be whatever you want it to Completely subjective. Be. Is there any differences, Keith? Keith, you've been in this business for 20 years, industry trainer for, for many years at one of the largest chains in transmissions. Uh, it all depends on who is building the transmission at that particular time as far as what you're going to end up with. And that's a very key point. You really need to have a place that's going to be up front and they're going to be honest with you and say here is your transmission that's what we do here and that's that's what I like so much about being here I can show you exactly what I'm doing to your transmission and it's in front of you it's in front of me and I'm gonna tell you what it's gonna be like when it, when everything's said and done it's gonna be done right well in the games have changed in transmission in the old days your car was worn out at a hundred thousand miles so if you got a transmission rebuilt with a 12, 12 month 12,000 mile warranty you were happy but nowadays, you know, you may buy a transmission, let's say, on your Honda Odyssey at 130,000 miles. Well, that car's only half and half broke in. You may run that car to 250,000 miles. So if you're going to spend money on a transmission, you only want to do it once before you get rid of that car. So we like to custom remanufacture transmissions. That way you don't have one that's been done three, four, or five times. We, you get your transmission, what I call a virgin transmission. It's never been tinkered with before. <laughs> that is the best transmission for the car, and that's the one you want to remanufacture and stick back in your vehicle. You don't want somebody else's garbage. You don't know where it came from, who's building it, what's happening. And I've never, never rebuilt a transmission before, but there's parts that kind of wear together right Keith I don't, I don't I mean you want to keep all those parts you go to a rebuilder uh, not, I mean we're talking the national brand or where they get them in a, in a in a crate for example the people say well well Ford I can go to the dealer and get a brand new one no what Ford did is they went to a big manufacturer or remanufacturer and said we're gonna guarantee you that we're gonna buy a hundred thousand uh, these units a year what's the best price so it's the low bid process Low bid process, the bid has to get better. You know, it's a three-year contract. In some cases, it has to get better by 5% every year. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, you know, price controls there. And then the other thing is, is that, you know, on a mass production level, you know, we can put a, a $5 pump bushing in a transmission that's Teflon coated where the next guy is just going to use a five, you know, $2 Babbitt bushing or whatever it may be. You know, because there's a three dollar difference. Well, we're not in the mass scale. We don't have an economy of scale where we can put nicer parts in there. And the other thing, we're not dealing with freight. If I buy something out of the Midwest, 
I've got $200 in freight to make up with. So my point is, you can get it done locally, and I think you can get it done better. Why not keep the money in Arizona? That's that's my shop my local, big thing. right? Shop local. You know, it's good for your industry. So well, and the other thing is, when I was talking about these parts, that when that transmission was put together the first time, everything was brand new. It's a match set. They, yeah, it's a match set. So when you when your car, if you get one of those box rebuilt transmissions, let's say they disassemble those, they throw all the parts in baskets, all the all the X parts go here, all the Y parts go here, all the cases go here, and they get cleaned. And then they just start going down the assembly line, and, and, and the builders pick, oh, I need a valve. Okay, just grab one of 25 out of the basket. We'll grab one in. in, in right. It kind of turns out to be a little bit of a hodgepodge. All that stuff is worn together. So let's get the phones up for this segment. Let's go with Greg. Go ahead, Greg. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. What can we help you with? Good morning, guys. Thanks for taking the call. You I bet. Had, uh, my son has a 2003 Ford Taurus. With the 3.0 dual overhead cam, uh, VIN model S no, uh, engine. He's got a coolant leak somewhere. It's not hitting the ground anywhere, and there's no white smoke in the tailpipe, so it, it's heating it up in the cylinder somewhere. Is my uh, thought. Okay. Well, there's going to be a c- couple ways to to find that. If you're certain it's not going well. Even if it's not going on the ground, doesn't mean it's going to the cylinders. It depends on how big of a leak that is and how often you have to add fluid because that could very easily be seeping out, evaporating a little bit and before it even hits the ground. Uh, so that would be one thing to look at to start with, with pressure testing the radiator. And then it could be going into a heater core, but you would think that would be, you know, after some time, that's going to end up on the floorboard of the car, steam on the windshield, or dripping out uh, like your air conditioning condensation line. And if it's going into the cylinders, sometimes those can be really difficult. We can do block tests, but they don't always work. It could be different when it's hot, when it's cold. The The best way to f- narrow that down is to do a cylinder leak down test where we're going to pull all the spark plugs out of the engine, put it on top dead center, and we're going to pressurize the cylinder. Say we're going to put 100 pounds of pressure in the cylinder, and then we're going to watch the coolant level and see if the coolant level rises out of the radiator or the overflow bottle, the expansion tank. And because we're moving air into the cooling system, out of the cylinder, into the cooling system, it's going to raise the coolant level. We're going to be looking for bubbles. Well, the other thing that happens that a lot of people don't think about is radiators sometimes will leak into the transmission. Ah, uh, yeah. And they're the place it can go. So take a look at your transmission fluid. Make sure we're not losing transmission fluid, or uh, I'm sorry, engine coolant into the transmission. Yeah, if you've got a strawberry milkshake on your it's not good, <laughs> not good, not good at all. So, And we see that a lot more nowadays is that we see radiators fail where the transmission cooler, uh, you know, you get the coolant, engine coolant into the transmission and it wrecks the transmission pretty darn quickly. So... Anyway, 602-277-5827. We are going to go with Bob. Go ahead, Bob. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. Yeah, I guess my mom has a 2005 Lincoln town car, and if you get it on the freeway from 0 to 60, it doesn't shift hard, but if you're in stop-and-go traffic around 30 miles an hour, and then you let off on the gas, and then you step on it again to get going, I hate to use the word, but it clunks, you know, really hard or shifts hard. And I, I just, I've taken it into a guy, and he goes, oh, no, that's okay, that's normal. And I'm thinking, that's no, not normal, because it really shifts hard, right around 30 to 35 miles an hour. And I don't, any ideas? Well, Ken, I'm going to I'm gonna throw that over to you, unless I'm putting you on the spot. So we've got, it sounds like maybe a coasting down shift, hard shift. So you're rolling up to a stoplight, and you're kind of coasting, and the light turns green, you go ahead and get back onto it. Is that what I'm hearing? That that's what I'm hearing. That's what you're hearing. Yeah, but you know, it, it, I I love checking for codes because uh, <laughs> that's usually where I like to start. And a lot of codes, a lot of transmission codes, will not set a check engine light. Mm. So a customer will drive around for months and not know they have a code in their transmission module, and come to find out they bring it into the shop. The first thing I do is scan it. I want to know if there's any codes in there. The, the computer's not a tell-all, but it's a great place to start. So see if there's any error messages in there. Right. I just want to see if that's a good place to start. And if it is, then I, at least I've got some kind of direction. But that's definitely where I would start. Keith, your face looks pregnant with thought. What do you got? Well, there, there's <laughs> a lot of ways this can go. And that's where, you know, Ken and I go back and forth. And we look at all the details because a lot of times uh, computer data will tell us as well. There might be a sensor that's glitching, like a speed sensor. And... Uh, 
throttle position sensor that's you know giving an intermittent signal at a certain speed or it could be a major problem inside the transmission where something is getting ready to give up and uh, that's the time that it really shows its true colors. Well, a lot of times whenever there's a diagnostic trouble code, so the computer is more sensitive at picking up slips from the transmission than we are. So if it sees a little slip, what it'll do is elevate the pressure in the transmission via electronic pressure control solenoid. So if the, if the computer is seeing an error, it may shift hard intermittently where the next day you drive it, that hard shift has gone away. I don't know how many people say, oh, I got had this intermittent hard shift been going on for like two years, but it, every time I take it to the shop, everything's working fine. Right. Well, but then Ken brought up pulling codes. Mm -hmm. And all the time we hear, oh, I, I, I went to AutoZone or I went somewhere I, or I bought my, my code checker and I check codes. But not all scan tools are created equally. So not every scan tool is going to get into the transmission control module or, or uh, you know, it, and sometimes they won't even see all the codes. They're just going to see the generic codes, maybe not the manufactured codes, right, Ken? Right. I have three scanners sitting on my toolbox at all times ready to scan. And there's, there's reasons I have three. And there's a go-to scanner, and it doesn't do the generic stuff. It does everything. You pull up some cars, and there's 26 modules in that car. And... 95% of the computer, or the scanners out there will not read any but one of those modules. We, we have a diagnostic process that goes on, and, and Ken checks out an uh, awful lot of cars. He does the same systematic diagnostic approach to every last one of them, and they come through, and if he's got questions, sometimes they'll go bounce something off Keith, and then he brings it up to us, and he says, here's what I think is going on, and then I'll look at it, and I'll say, hmm, I'll read the customer's symptom, and then I'll read what he wrote, and he'll say no codes, and I'll say, it's got to have a code in it. This description is perfect. It examples of 1870 code in a Chevrolet. It's, it's not there. We don't see the code. Try a different scanner. You go use a different scanner. There it is. Bang. You know, this whole time we've been chasing our tail because it wasn't there. Well, but with all the electronics and the transmissions, what do we have? Is there a new 8 or 9-speed Chrysler transmission? There's, there's tons of electronics happening. The battery. People overlook the battery. I think just like in our shop, the first thing you're probably doing is checking the battery. And I don't care if it starts the car. That doesn't mean it's good enough to run the run the system. Battery and alternator test is, is probably the first place to look. Well, we got some more phone calls we're going to get to you after the break. 602-277-5827. We're going to do a little bit of fact or fiction in regards to transmission fluid. You are listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio out on location at Tri-City Transmission in Tempe where we are buying you lunch and giving you an open house and a tour of the inside of a transmission. <laughs> Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are here helping you get to know your car, helping you know how to, where to take your car to get it fixed. Today we're talking about transmissions and transmission repair, and we hope you don't ever need any, but if you do, we want you to know where to go, and that's Tri-City Transmission. Uh, I've got Keith Clark and Ken Magrum who are the lead technicians here at Tri-City Transmission, here to help us out. So if you guys are anywhere in the neighborhood and want to stop by for a grilled cheese sandwich from the grilled cheese truck, step on by. The tater tots are amazing. And we're also doing shop tours. We've got transmissions exploded in the back, exploded in the sense that they're all taken apart, and you can see all 1,000 pieces in the modern transmission. Well, you so. know what the other thing, too, is a lot of people have never been, probably the majority of the people have never been underneath a car. So it's not just the transmission necessarily. You're looking at, you know, you can see the drive line and really understand. When we take people out in the shop to give them show and tell, because just like you, w when they have it, that's that big purchase. And you like, I know you like to take them out there and show them. I, there's nothing more that I like than to have somebody truly understand what they're getting or what they're buying. And if you can take them out and show them. So maybe you don't have a transmission problem today. But if you want to come out and see and get, you know, we're not talking about crawling underneath the floor. These cars are up in the air. Some of them are in process. And, and maybe you want to see what a drive shaft looks like or, uh, you know, I don't know, the bottom of the engine or, or how the brakes look for that matter. Uh, everything's open down here. The whole shop is open up. It's a beautiful facility. And uh, come come join us. And we're here till how late are we going to be here, Dave? We'll be here till 1, one o'clock or so. And then when's happy hour? <laughs> one thirty. <That's> <laughs> right. Happy hours at one thirty. So, uh, you know for sure. Uh, tours come come by. Feel free to check it out. Uh, we're gonna go. Oh, factor fiction. The factor fiction for the day is that all transmission fluids are the same. Fact or fiction, Matt? What do you think? Well, <laughs> are they all the same? No, no, they're not. They are, they're all. Well, I was gonna say they're all red. They're not even red. <laughs> some are blue. Some are green. Yeah, the they've been changing the colors. 
No, definitely not. They're they're, they're not the same. And, but they don't they make one that makes them all the same, right? Well, there, there there's a multi fill. You know, it's like oh yeah, this one will work in your car. You know, works in a BMW. Is it works in a Ford? Is it works in a Honda? Fact or fiction? Is that true? I mean. Being on the tour I gave you earlier, what, do you, what did you see back there? A well, shelf with how many different oils on it? Give me a tour, Dave. I've been here so many <laughs> times. But, but yeah, if, if they were all the same, you wouldn't have, uh, what, 34, 32, 34. 32 different transmission fluids on, on the shelf or in bulk containers. They're, they are not the same. And it's, you know, it's... Is it maybe well, is it snake oil? And and I wanted to know the answer. So we had we had him on the show here not too long ago. We had Jason Crowlin from uh, Lab One, who's a tribologist, if I'm saying that right. We actually sent him all 34 of those factory fill transmission fluids, and we had him test them all. And they checked for additive packages to see what was in there. Was it more boron, more calcium, more zinc? What was in there? And then we also had him do an infrared scan where he could look at the ester band to see the level of synthetic in the oil. And it was, it was really eye-opening because we found that, you know, three brands, let's just say a Volvo and a Nissan, Volvo Fluid and Nissan Matic K were identical. But, yeah, they were completely different than a Honda. Yeah, but that price isn't identical. Yeah, one, is was, one was 4 bucks a quart, one was 20 bucks a quart. So there is some BS in there and some branding, marketing that goes on. But there is a difference. You know, there's some different categories of different oils that are going in these transmission. I mean, one of the ones that was funny, Ken, uh, was a Volkswagen. We had two different Volkswagen fluids, two different part numbers. They chemically were identical, but they were two different colors. Yeah. <laughs> one came out of two different plants on different sides of the country, just different colors. It's strange. I mean, there, there's who knows what's going on behind the, behind the scenes and why they do that, but there's just those little tweaks and little... Little Thanks differences. The recipe to make it for them. So, Up first this segment, we're going to go with Caesar. Caesar, you're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. How can we help you today? Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my call. Love this show. I have a 2006 Scion XB, and just in the morning for about two to three minutes, it takes a hard shift, as in the RPMs will rise maybe between 3,000, 4,000, and it won't shift down in between first and second gear. I've done the regular maintenance service, and I'm at about the uh, horrible 100,000 mile mark. Uh, any ideas? And that's a it's an automatic transmission. So the first shift in the morning is from maybe first to second gear. Seems firm. That's correct. Yep, and it does a real hard shift. You can you know feel that thump in it. Keith, you got a question there for uh, Caesar? Uh, actually, I just want to make a comment on that. Uh, a lot of uh, the newer vehicles, they're, they have a, a computer programming that allows, the, well, wa- uh, makes the vehicle want to warm up quicker. Mm-hmm. So what happens is they will delay that shift, that first shift, the first couple of shifts a lot of times, so that the vehicle can, uh, the engine can rev up and it'll work a little bit harder. So it'll reach, the engine will reach operating temperature as well as the transmission uh, a lot quicker. So right. that first shift, a lot of times, especially with the newer Toyotas, being a higher gear ratio, you're going to feel that. Oh, scratching the tires in second gear, huh? Exactly. <laughs> it's going to feel like a performance car. Well, and you said something too, Keith. You said a lot of newer cars. Now, someone that owns a 2006 car may be sitting there going, that's seven years old. That's not a newer car. It's newer no, to us. In fact, it is. Mm-hmm. And... and and ever since they've been trying to get lower emissions, they're computer controlled. They're, that is a modern car. Now, maybe a 2011 is ultra modern, but a 2006 is a newer car, and that technology is, is not still new anymore, but it is what a term we may, may use. It's a new car. Well, Caesar, my advice to you would be to get it to a, get it to a transmission shop or somebody who can go in and pinpoint a problem. You're going to want to get to them in the evening so they can drive it cold first thing in the morning. I don't want to blow it off as just an idiosyncrasy, and that may all be all it is. You know, I get up a little slower every morning than I did, you know, 10 years ago. So it does have some miles on it, but that transmission will last 200,000 miles. But we can be starting to have a warm pressure regulator valve. The one thing in transmissions that really happens is that the fluid characteristics are so different between when the vehicle is cold versus when the vehicle is hot. So if we're starting to get some wear or some hardening of the seals, some of that stuff starting to show up. But a lot of times we're doing Toyota valve bodies. We're going in and re- replacing a pressure regulator valve. So I appreciate the phone call. We're going to sneak in Kyle. Go ahead, Kyle. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. How you guys doing? Good. Uh, my uh, daughter's got a 2006 PT Cruiser, 
with 80,000 miles on it, and uh, I drove it the other day, and as you accelerate, it sounds like the transmission's making a really kind of a whiny noise, almost like as if you had mud and snow tires on it, and it gets louder and louder till you hit about 40 miles an hour, and then it starts to quiet back down a little bit. Well, one of the things that I, I, I like to think about, Kyle, is we'll see alternators fool people, and they'll think it's a transmission noise. So noises are one of the toughest things that we, we look at on cars. A lot of times they'll pull the belt off to make sure the noise isn't actually coming from the engine. So you can send us an email at bumper to bumper com on the contact link, and I'll be happy to get you some more information. We appreciate you joining us. Remember, we're out here for another hour or two, free grilled cheese sandwiches at Tri-City Transmission. Thanks, Peter and Tom, for setting up this remote. Ken and Keith, thanks for helping out our listeners. Remember not to text and drive, and we will be back with you next week.